السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عسى أن يكون خيرا عسى أن يكن خيرا منهن ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن لم يتب فأولئك هم الظالمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثم ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه أيحب أحدكم أن يحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله واتقوا الله إن إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خيرا يا زكريا um, uh, we, we've been enjoying your قراءة and your تلاوة in our houses for a long for, for a few months now زكريا so I don't know after quarantine how we're going to be able to not have all this beautiful قراءة in our houses we need to tape you I guess inshallah الله يعطيك العافية جزاك الله خير Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, welcome to our Friday night lecture. Um, uh, 
We, uh, our, I guess, our post Ramadan back to our normal schedule, Friday night lectures that the Muslim Unity Center has been doing ever since quarantine and stay home has started. And we're going to continue until um, until we are able to get back into our masajid. But alhamdulillah, um, thank God for technology and thank God for what Allah has given us in this time that we've been able to cope and and deal with everything that um, and and deal and and also be able to have all this knowledge and wonderful access to information available at our fingertips, right at our phones, alhamdulillah. Um, tonight's lecture is talking about um, dismantling, dismantling anti-Black racism within our Muslim communities. Um, it comes uh, obviously at the heels of, of um, many events that have happened in the past two weeks that have stirred the nation. Um, and, and although we know that these events are not, it's not the first time that that's happened, and you know, unfortunately, I don't know if it's going to be the last time, unfortunately, but but that's really the, the focus of this conversation tonight is um, how we can really dismantle anti-Black racism in our communities um, for a long-term basis. How can we become those people, those Muslims that um, are not reacting to these things, but really diving further into our deen and into our um, prophetic teachings and 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 learning and and becoming true, I guess anti-racist in, in today's terminology, um, as as our dean has prescribed us to to be. Um, you know, I I heard a lecture the other day with Imam Majid, and he said that a person that is racist is one that does not know Allah, because when you know Allah, you know that He has created all of us equally, and the only one that is different is in taqwa, and so. And so it's something that we need to think about as Muslims. Um, I'm going to introduce a speaker to you today. And the speaker is um, a, 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 actually a friend of mine, alhamdulillah. Um, I haven't seen her though for a while, um, but but I'm honored to be able to introduce her um, and and allow you all to um, to know to know this person and to really learn from her because her uh, she's She's a powerful, mashallah, young woman whose power in, comes in her in her commitment to her Lord and her commitment to this deen. And she speaks the truth due to that commitment of her of her deen. So I'm going to introduce to you Nabintu, Nabintu Dumbia. Um, she's a law student and community organizer with the Muslim American Society and the Islamic community of as Salam, Detroit. She's the co-founder of the Sisterhood of Yerelun. Is that right, Nabintu? Did I say it right? Okay, a community initiative providing holistic support to young black Muslim women. The initiative's name derives from the Mandinka philosophy, knowledge of self, which I'm excited to hear. I hope you hear talk a little bit about that, inshallah. Um, Nabintu is going to be talking to us and educating us, and and I hope that we can take all this moment to to really open our hearts to sit with a, a, a with with a clear mind and open hearts. And with the sincere du'a that Allah allows us to learn and to reflect from Nabintu's words, inshallah. So, Jazakallah khair, Nabintu. Jazakallah khair, um, Fatima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani ya qaw qawli. Oh Allah, expand for me my chest, ease my task for me, and untie the knot from my speech that they may understand what I say. Um, I would like to start off by thanking Sheikh Masmari for reaching out to me, um, asking that I do this uh, talk and, and give these reflections and things I've been sitting on um, and, and to the entire Unity Center community, I think, and I hope that it goes without saying that this conversation um, is one that's long overdue. I think it's one that we've been having for some time now. Um, and I think it's unfortunate and with heavy hearts that we find ourselves um, back in a, in a similar and, and or familiar place, but, but I think it's important. And I think the purpose of this talk tonight is that we start to think um, seriously and actively about how we can continue to um, really see, understand, and define our roles in, in, in what um, addressing and dismantling anti-Black racism not only in you know the larger community, larger society, but but I think specifically in starting with within our own communities, um, what we want that to look like, um, especially um, not if but but when the momentum dies, as we know that it inevitably 
inevitably will, um, inshallah. So in as I you know, sort of start, I, I'm immediately just reminded um, in, in thinking about the dua that I have chosen to start with um, tonight. And I think a dua that for many of us, um, we go back to um, when we find ourselves in difficult situations, when we find ourselves, um, you know, maybe trying to really communicate um, or articulate different views and perspectives. Um, and especially when we find ourselves trying to do that to people who are in positions of power. And not only this, but but I'm I'm specifically thinking about um, a reflection by I think one of the most brilliant scholars and teachers of our time, um, Dr. Bilal Ware, when he you know places this draw into context and and when he talks about how he has found it continuously difficult for you know, our community, the Muslim community in particular, to continue to tell and to take so much pride in the story of Musa alayhi salam as we do and as we rightfully should, but in the same breath, um, simultaneously remain extremely complacent in addressing anti-Black racism in our community. And of course, this reflection by Dr. Bilal Ware um, is not surprising, right, when you place it into context, when you think about the fact that Black Americans um, are unquestionably the Bani Israel of our time today, um, especially in our closest context, which is here in the United States. Um, when we think and when we talk about the gruesome actions of, of an oppressor like Fir'aun, it is, um, I think, an injustice on our part when we're not able to really sit with those reflections and directly place them into the context um, of the state and to specifically think about what Dr. Bilal Ware says um, is that you know the 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 actions of the United States government, especially and specifically against Black Americans, would make someone like Fir'aun blush. Um, and so I, I I really just want to start in this way to kind of I think set the tone. Um, and how we should really be thinking about this issue um, and this call to really take dismantling anti-Black racism in our community seriously as a religious and a spiritual call and not necessarily just one of community um, and, and one of social justice, but that it's deeper than that. And that it's at, in fact directly connected to who we are as Muslims, who we are as believers and as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so from that, I. I'm thinking um, about, you know, even how the topic came about, right? So when Sheikh Masmedi reached out to me, I I thought deeply about, you know, what to address and to sort of how to think about, I think, this issue and how to push ourselves to continue to think about it um, in a more critical way than perhaps we have been, because it's an issue that unfortunately we find still exists within our communities. And so as I was sitting with this and thinking about what might be the most productive thing to talk about and what I kept referring to as a short talk, but Sheikh Masmei kept saying, it's not that short. <laughs> um, what I immediately thought about was actually pre-Islamic Arab society and, and, and sort of drew this analogy between the ways in which Islam came and had to come to this society and, and that in comparison to what we see ourselves facing and dealing with today. And so one of the things that we absolutely know without a doubt about um, the Arab society prior to the coming of Islam was that it was predominantly dependent on its class-based societal structure, right? Who people were, their ancestral links, sort of the interconnectedness between them could, and in fact would determine an individual's fate from the very beginning of their life until their very last breath. And it's it's fair to say that there was very little um, wiggle room for, for how they could sort of um, get out of this very strict structure. And so when I think about that, when I think about this very clan-based system and how important relationships were for people, I immediately think about the fact that any belief system that was going to be tasked with redirecting the most innate compass in the children of Adam could not have been successful if it did not simultaneously come as an action-driven system and one that was firmly rooted in this idea and practice of justice, right? So this, this idea that 
The religion of Islam could not have looked any other way than one that would come to not merely amend existing laws or give out a couple rounds of monetary charity to the less fortunate, or it couldn't have even come as a way of making politically correct recommendations to oppressive rulers of its time. There was no way. Um, but instead, Islam could have only ever looked the way that we know that it did, which was this total revolutionary command um, to, to sort of reinstill this call that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And, and with that, to make this command that if what it takes is for us to completely flip a society on its head in order to get back to this divinely ordered position of enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil, then flipping society on its head is a very low cost. And so I think about the fact that you know, when a society like the one that we know existed, when, when, when you come to a society and it's found burying its daughters alive, the solution would never be successful if it was to come and to teach this society about the value of women, why young girls are important, why girls are a blessing, right? We could have even, perhaps even attempting to teach people that, you know, um, girls are actually like better than boys, right? None of those tactics would have ever worked in a place where people were found burying, you know, human beings alive. Um, so I think that when we think about that, the question must be asked um, whether anything other than Islam as we know it could have been successful. And, and, and I wanna make the argument or set forth this, this conclusion that the Islam that we do know that came, the solution that we know that came was one that essentially said, it's not enough to look at problems through their symptoms. It's not enough to look at the ways in which problems manifest and try to fix those manifestations, try to fix those symptoms. Instead, Islam really calls us to be able to understand issues at their root causes and to directly tackle it from that place, right? So I think that what, what this ultimately allows us to do is, is to really ask this question that brings us closer to showing no mercy in how we tackle root causes that lead to such a disturbing place like burying daughters. And in our context today, anti-Black racism, right? Where we, where we literally find ourselves in a space where people have to continuously um, ask to be humanized as for no other reason other than the color um, of their skins. And so in thinking about this, um, what immediately comes to mind is that when we make the decision to look at the roots of the issues that are presented before us, I think that it, what it forces us to do is to look into the mirror. I think that we become exposed to this greed and this persistent denial and a commonly unknown shirk in the form of egotism and arrogance, right? We must sit with ourselves and think about how we have benefited from systems that not only perpetuate but uphold anti-Black racism, right? And, and a lot of that is rooted in capitalism. And we must think about the ways in which we benefit from these systems and, and, and be honest with ourselves that when we make a call to uproot systems in, in order to address problems from their roots, that we're ultimately putting some of our benefits on the line. And I think that that's how we become, or that's one of the primary ways that we really become exposed to the greed that's on the line. So this long established reality of anti-Black racism in this country um, I like to think is, is one that's actually not that difficult to recognize as systemic when we start to make this conscious decision to reject any idea that asks us to place racism or to view racism through the lens of its symptoms or through the lens of how racism manifests as opposed to where racism comes from. Right. I think it's this sh rejection of shallow solutions that look like book drives that we find ourselves doing, um, perhaps to a local Detroit public school, while we simultaneously turn a blind eye to research backed conclusions, such as the fact that reading levels of black boys are used to assess how many prisons will be built in the upcoming years. 
It's this rejection of any baseless thought process that pushes the American dream narrative when we know now, statistically speaking, that Black Americans have made up 13% of this country's population while only being given access to 2.7% of its wealth. I think that it's knowing how to interact with the reality that Black immigrants um, like myself and, and like my family and parents who immigrated from Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa, that Black immigrants in fact possess higher rates of educational degree attainment than any other immigrant group in this country. Yet those same Black immigrants earn lower wages than any other similarly trained immigrants and have the highest unemployment rates of any other foreign, foreign born group. Um, to continue, I think I think included in that is, is really just this reminder that whenever and wherever any other community has experienced government surveillance, like we know that the Muslim community has been plagued by, um, you know, post 9-11, I think it's this reminder, or it should be this reminder that whenever we are engaging with this idea of government surveillance, we must remember that there has always been a J. Edgar Hoover who was armed with the COINTELPRO program to not merely silence Black activists like Imam Jamil El Amin, who is still incarcerated as I speak today, but to launch this persistent attempt to completely eradicate any way, shape, or form of Black leadership that's rooted in Black empowerment. And I think that finally, um, as I desperately hope that, you know, if we didn't know before that we know by now, I think that, you know, the refusal to stop looking at symptoms and to, to instead look at the roots in our understanding of racism, I think that that's this act of resistance that forces us to reflect on and to know and, and, and to say and never forget that systems like law enforcement, as we know it in this country, was never crafted with the intent to protect Black men like George Floyd or Amadou Jallo and Black women like Breonna Taylor. Rather, what we do know is that it's a hyper-aggressive criminal justice system that responds to something as, as basic and baseless as counterfeit bills with inherently anti-Black pol police tactics that directly leads to the murder of Black men and Black women um, black girls and black boys like Tamir Rice. And so I hope that, you know, if we can begin to take seriously this, this call to not be able to afford to look at, you know, dismantling anti-blackness through um, its symptoms, I hope that what this will encourage us to do is to think seriously about how we can actually do so by tackling the roots. And I think that when we do this, um, that's when we can actually get somewhere. And I think that that's when we can actually begin to talk seriously about what's actually required of us and, and, and then start to think about how we actually interact with the steps that we can perhaps take in order to get us closer um, to a place where anti-Blackness doesn't exist within our communities. And so I think to sort of bring it down closer to ourselves, you know, from, from less of a um, very national and even world perspective, but but much closer to home within the Muslim community. And when I think about like steps that we can take and because and, and, I think one of the things that's extremely important is for us to have these conversations from a very practical perspective. Um, I don't think that it's, it's productive at all for us to continue um, to really get up in arms when something extremely difficult, like like the murder of innocent black men like George Floyd when things like this happen for us to, you know, get up in arms and, and you know, really show our, our passion against racism via uh, Facebook and Instagram posts and attending protests when we ultimately go back and retrieve into homes and communities where we allow ourselves to continue to be complacent in anti-Blackness, right? Um, and so what are the steps? Like, what does that mean? What do we do with, with this idea or how do we interact with this idea of no longer stopping and looking at racism through the ways in which it manifests or through its symptoms, but to actually get to some of the root causes that have created them? I think that one of the first things um, that we must pay attention to or that we must do is, is, is to sort of practice this introspection that should stem from 
a brutal honesty and a brutal truth with ourselves. And I think that that is nothing less than, than the truth that our communities are in fact racist, that our communities are anti-Black. Um, I think that we must begin at the premise that we do harbor anti-Black ideas and biases and stereotypes that spill into our actions, such as the exclusivity that exists within so many of our communities. And one of the ways that I think that this tip can actually, or step or whatever, can be productive is for us to immediately pay attention to how we react when you hear me say that, right? When you hear me say that, like, yeah, we come from racist communities, that, that's actually a fact, right? I think the reaction that we have to that is very telling, right? Because I think the reaction can either speak to um, this awareness, right? Even if we don't necessarily feel as though most active in stopping it, we don't at least, we at least know that or other hand, um, this denial, right? This this idea that like, no, 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 we're not racist in our community. That's not an issue that we have, we're good. And the reason that I call that denial um, is because when I, as a black Muslim, have to think carefully and critically about where I will spend Taraweeh or Ramadan as a whole, um, just in order to avoid coming in contact with really weird, like racist you know, encounters, I think that speaks directly to the fact that this is still a problem in our communities. And I think it speaks to the ways in which we haven't actually attempted to really tackle it the way um, that is required of us, right? And so I think that a good example um, and how we can do this is, is really sitting with ourselves and thinking about the diversity that exists within our spaces, and not only at a community level, but I think that one of the things that we know now um, in, in movement work and in policy work as well, is that where the power is, um, is oftentimes very telling, right? So organizations can, can, you know, frame and market themselves as diverse all they want, but ultimately when we look at who the decision makers are and when we don't see that diversity reflected, then is when we know something is wrong. Um, I think a second thing is for us to really recognize that, you know, sort of like along, along the lines of where I started, is to really sort of internalize and, 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 and get ourselves to a place where we actually know and believe that doing anti-racism work is a favor to yourself. It's not a favor to black people. I think that so many times we fall into thinking that we are creating for other people, right? That by virtue of making our community safer for young um, and older black Muslims, um, and beyond that we're somehow doing it as a favor to them, right? We're, we're allowing this to be a welcoming space for people when the reality is, and I think Dr. Bilal Ware does a really good job at getting to this, um, the truth is that this work um, is actually, is in fact a way to directly distance ourselves from the sunnah of Iblis, right? And, and, and anti-blackness as we know it, and I think as we should continue to talk about it and think critically about is, is a spiritual disease no less, right? It's this idea of being able to feel if we don't say that we in fact um, are you know, better than, than any other group of people and that it's okay for us to feel that way. And I think that what we've gotten used to in our communities and in our spaces is thinking that the only way for anti-blackness to exist is um, in a very overt or like explicit way, right? Um, when that's not the truth, when that when that's just not true, right? We know now by virtue of having access to things such as the implicit biases test that so many of the ways in which we continue to allow um, anti-black racism to not only um, exist, but I think to thrive in our communities is because we don't have the difficult conversations, right? Um, that 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 include more you know subtle forms of how this presents itself in our homes and in our friend groups and in our communities. And then I think thirdly, um, and, and and Fatima sort of spoke about this in the very beginning, which I think is important. I think a third and important step is for us to remember and to think about the fact that like not being racist is in fact insufficient, right? That that we must get to a place where we are actually anti-racist. And, and this is something um, that, is, that has been coined by author and historian um, Kendi, and, and he, he, he essentially says that there's no such thing as being not racist, right? And, and the way that he explains this is, is by ultimately getting into um, the fact that when you so 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 either you're acting or you're not right and and he essentially makes the connection that inaction 
um, is a part of racism, right? Because what we know by now and sort of what I try, how I tried to set up the backdrop um, earlier today is that racism is a systemic issue, right? Um, when you have things that exist like, um, you know, a, a lack of access to things, to, re to basic resources, right? So education, healthcare, et cetera, that disproportionately impacts specific groups of people. What we know by now is that by virtue of racism being systemic, just doing nothing is in fact like allowing it to continue to thrive. Um, I think in many ways, actually, like that's probably like the prefer that's probably like the preference for people who uphold for people who like put these systems in place. They're like, yeah, if you guys could just do nothing, that would be great. Um, and so and so this idea that inaction is actually racist, if if you really think about it, um, and 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 that really connects well um, to to this idea of being bystanders. And and I think that one of the reasons that this really resonates with me, and I think one of the reasons it makes so much sense to us, or should make a sense to us as Muslims, is because this concept is actually extremely familiar with familiar to us, right? We don't come from a tradition where you can just see injustice and do nothing. And as long as you're not participating in it, then you're good, right? But in fact, we know from um, the hadith, such as the one that was the, the one that's on the authority of Abu Sa'id that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said and made it clear that whoever sees an injustice or sees an evil, any act of evil is required to stop it with their hands. Right. And if we're unable to, then to do so with your tongue. And then if you're unable to, to do it in your heart and, and then goes a step further and lets us know that having a hatred or a discomfort of it in our hearts is, in fact, the weakest of faith. And so I think that, you know, when you place that hadith into this context, it, it's the exact same thing. Right. This notion that we can't skip the steps of changing things with our hands. Right. Um, stopping, you know, acts of racism when we see them happening in our communities or, you know, at a lower level, changing them with our tongue, right? Stopping people when they're actually saying problematic things, even when there's no one around, when there's no black person to even hear them say it. But, but just by virtue of becoming someone who won't tolerate that in your space, that we can't skip those two steps and automatically choose to hate something in our heart. Um, and I think one of the reasons that this is so profound is because um, to skip those steps, I think, is almost as if like trying to cheat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And Allah already lets us know, like he he know like by ver he's closer to us than our jugular vein, right? Um, and, and knows like the whispers of our hearts, knows things about us that we ourselves don't even know. And so I think that, you know, as I as I you know sort of wrap up and I and I think we want to take questions um once Fatima joins us back. I really want to encourage us to just think critically about the ways in which we um, directly, I think, not only allow the problem to exist, but I think that we actually participate in it. And, and I would encourage, I think, just by virtue of this being Unity Center and being a predominantly non-Black community, I would encourage um, that the way that we do this, the first way that we do this is to actually sit with ourselves and think critically about the kinds of conversations that we allow to happen um, with us and, and around us and the kinds of conversations that we especially to ha allow to happen when no one else is around, right? When we're in our communities, when we're in safe spaces and perhaps there's no, there's no one there to hold us accountable, to think about the fact that Islam does that. Islam holds us accountable. This hadith holds us accountable and that we don't need, you know, fellow black Muslims to be there in order for us to feel as though we need to be, you know, completely on guard or, or to be very aware of the things that we are allowing to transpire um, within in, in our spaces. Um, and then I think secondly, and, and because mm -hmm. this is extremely important, I think one of the first steps um, is for us to allow ourselves to, to, to join people in reimagining a new world. A lot of what we're seeing right now um, is not talking about like, like people are done like with crumbs, you know what I mean? Like we don't, people are not like accepting, um, okay, fine, we'll do this, right? Or like a bill that like stops cops from using excessive force, right? Like that, like bills don't really, you know what I mean? Like some of these things were already illegal, we know that. Um, but instead, people want, or and people are calling to very quote unquote radical ideas and radical solutions like defunding the police, um, abolishing prisons, and really just flipping society on its head. 
And I think that when we find ourselves feeling uncomfortable by these ideas, when we find ourselves feeling uncomfortable by these notions, I think that one of the most important things for us to do is to go back to our own tradition, to go back to who we are as Muslims, and to remember that when the Prophet wasallam came to a pre-Islamic, or began preaching, sorry, to a pre-Islamic um, Arab society, pre-Islamic Arabia, um, so many, if not all of the calls that Islam made were radical, right? Islam didn't come and say, okay, I get it, you guys are doing this, no, right? This, this idea that when things are so corrupt and when things are so unjust, that the only way to strike it back to the middle, to get us back to the middle nation that we try to be, is to really pull us to another quote unquote extreme. And I think that one of the things that's important for us to do right now is to really just listen. Um, and to pay attention to the calls that people are making and to not necessarily listen in order to respond to them, to not necessarily listen in order to say, oh, well, what does defunding the police mean? Like, how are we going to know? Because I think that when we do that, we're directly undermining um, the possibility and I think the imagination that goes with this. Um, for so many people speaking as a member of the black community myself, being able to hold on to um, this imagination of a new world and a new society is directly connected to being able to stay sane most of the time. And, and as we, and, and as I'm encouraging um, non-Black Muslims especially to do this, I think a second thing is, is to really um, be ready to take action, right? I don't think mm -hmm. that, I hope that by now this is obvious, but, but in, in the case that it's not, Black Muslims should not have to beg any masjid anywhere um, to, to put an end to relationships with, with law enforcement that is operated by the state. Um, we shouldn't have to ask communities to seriously consider uh, com uh, community policing um, because we're afraid of going to a masjid with cops around, right? These are, I think, calls that are long overdue. I think they're actions that are long overdue and that we should have done by now. But I but I, I guess I will say that if we haven't, I think it's important for us to start seriously thinking about them and seriously considering them and allowing ourselves to really challenge ourselves um, in order to, I don't think necessarily just answer some call that exists right now, but I think in fact to get back to our tradition as Muslims. Um, we are a people who when injustice exists, we don't ask politely. We don't come and we don't try to like, you know, make small changes and hope that it will have a big impact. We in fact flip societies on its head if that's what it takes in order to get back to a divinely ordered position of enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil. Uh, thank you all so much again. Um, and then Fatima, if you, I don't know if we're gonna take questions, but that's that's all I have. Jazakallah khair that was beautiful. Um, and we have people on our YouTube and Facebook channel that have been watching and have been agreeing and, and all sorts of things. Um, there was one comment that um, that somebody said that we have an issue of colorism within our respective communities as well, which is, we I think we all know that no matter what, um, you know, what ethnic background you come from, we know that there's, it's not just cross communities, but it's internally as well. And that's, that's a problem also, obviously. And so it's like, there's all these levels almost to like, um, having to confront this this issue. Um, there doesn't seem to be any questions, but I do have a question for you. I, I wanted to just see um, what you, what you and that then happened right now. So I'm just gonna make this quick and hopefully we can end with this is that, and then what, what would be the ideal? Like if you can imagine a Muslim American Michigan community, that's that's ideal. What would that look like to you? Such a good question. <laughs> um, I think that an ideal would definitely start to look like um, really just restructuring the way that I feel like power and, and access currently exists within our communities. I think one of the things that we um, know about racism right now is that the reason that it thrives um, as a system is because you're really able to lock people out of access to just like basic things, right? I think an ideal would look like people having everything that they need. 
um, to such extent to where we wouldn't have to um, do things that, you know, put people in difficult situations because people would actually be able to have access. And when people didn't have access, they would be able to have a route for asking for what they didn't have, right? I think what we have right now is we necessarily have, you know, um, a, a system that's off balance, right? We have, we, uh, I, I, something I'll never forget is uh, when uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj said, I stopped fundraising for, um, for Masajid to get chandeliers when I realized that there were some messages that didn't have, that had, that had roofs, roofs that were falling down. So I think about that, right? I think about the fact that like, that is our reality as, as the Muslim American community or Michigan Muslim community. Um, we like these differences are alarming, right? So I think that an ideal situation would look like people being able to have access to all of the resources that they need in order to really be able to thrive um, in a way to where they don't have to be in, you know, vulnerable positions um, and, and, and exist in very difficult situations as a result of those situations. Inshallah, we can strive to that. You mentioned um, Dr. Bilal Ware in your um, comments, um, and, and I, I want to kind of make this an opportunity for people that are listening and that people that will be listening to the recordings. If you could just end us with a couple people that um, we should be listening to, learning from, um, you know, that, that you feel would are important for us to know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Bilal, where I strongly, strongly um, encourage people to look into, um, especially to really be able, I think, to get us back to um, a place where we're viewing, um, you know, anti-Black racism from the spiritual lens that I think we've uh, moved away from just by virtue of, I think, um, leaning a lot more so on the spiritual justice elements. So I think it's so important for us to remember that, you know, this call is so much more than that, right? And that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable for. Um, uh, Sister Camila Rashad, who is my mentor, who's the founder of um, Muslim Wellness Foundation um, and puts on the Black Muslim Psychology Conference every year, I think is um, a great resource. She's currently leading on um, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition. Um, and then also other people who are involved with the Black Muslim COVID Coalition are, um, you know, people from Muslim Arc, um, so Namira Islam and Marguerite Hill. Um, I think Muslim Arc is a great place to start, especially as we begin to think seriously about how to address and dismantle anti-Black racism within our communities. Because I think one of the things that we have to um, be very cautious of and pay close attention to is that we don't, in an effort and in this eager and this passion to do something and, and to respond um, and to really be active, we want to make sure that we're not um, doing the wrong things, right? Um, and I think that Muslim Arc is such a great resource to be able to really provide, um, you know, anti-racism trainings and different resources in order to actually be able to do that. Um, and then I guess like the last person I'll mention, uh, there's a theme here, I'm mentioning all black women, it's intentional. Uh, I think Sister Donna Austin is amazing. Um, she's an anthropologist um, and, and really offers, offers us a way to look at issues of racism through a multifaceted lens, um, which I think is extremely important because I think a lot of times we tend to view anti-blackness through um, just one lens, I think, because it's easier that way. And I think it makes us uncomfortable when we're able to see how all of these different systems interact and necessarily impact each other. And I think Sister uh, Dr. Sorry, Donna Austin is, is a great person to facilitate that for people. JazakAllah khairan. And I think what we can do is, inshallah, on our Muslim Community Center page, we'll add some of these um, links and um, to, to these different people that are mentioned, or maybe on the bottom of this of this link. Barakallahu fiki. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your um, Thanks so much for your words. Was, um, they were they were very beautiful, and um, I mean, we learned alhamdulillah from you. Um, and we're going to be ending this uh, lecture tonight for our Friday night lecture. Um, it is now time for Maghrib, so Nabintu, you ended at a perfect timing, alhamdulillah. And let's end with a dua, inshallah, with Surah Al-Asr. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim, wal asr, inna l-insana lafi khusr, illa al-lazina aman wa amir salihat, wa dua asr al-haqq, wa dua asr al-sabr. Assalamu alaikum everybody, have a good evening. Bye, assalamu alaikum.